Good afternoon. My name is Janie Gordon, and I'm the program administrator for the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center. I'd like to welcome you all here today to our grand rounds uh, on healthcare needs of homeless populations in a health reform world. Before I introduce today's speakers, I have a few announcements. For people who are watching online, please check out our archived Grand Rounds and other online trainings. I'd also like to draw your attention to some of our live face-to-face -face trainings that are coming up, including social marketing on February 7th, effective writing for public health complaints, February 21st, and cultural competency for managers, February 27th. Our next Grand Rounds on February 20th will be about gun violence prevention and the National Violent Death Reporting System. For those watching online, please know that you can email a question for either or both of today's presenters by simply clicking on the link. We also do ask that you fill in the sign-in form so that we can give our federal funders a better idea of who is watching and how many people are watching today's webcast. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers today. And we're thrilled to have Kevin Lindemood and Barbara DiPietro with us. Um, both are from Healthcare for the Homeless. Kevin Lindemood, the fourth Chief Executive Officer of Healthcare for the Homeless, is a local and national leader on homelessness and health. He joined Healthcare for the Homeless two decades ago as a volunteer outreach worker and later served as a case manager, health policy organizer, community relations coordinator, director of public affairs, and vice president for external affairs. He chairs the state's Maryland Medi Medicaid Advisory Committee and serves on the boards of directors of the Mid-Atlantic Association of Community Health Centers, the Maryland Citizens Health Initiative, and the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Kevin previously taught health policy at the University of Maryland School of Social Work and speaks frequently throughout the community. He holds an MSW from the University of Michigan and a BS in philosophy and humanities from Valparaiso University, and I hope I got that right, Valparaiso University. <laughs> Our second speaker, Barbara DiPietro, PhD, has been working in public policy for 15 years, many of them specifically focused on health care and homelessness. She holds a master's degree in, po in policy sciences and a doctorate in public policy, both from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Her dissertation research focused on the impact of homelessness on emergency departments in Baltimore City, and she continues to work to ensure that healthcare systems can better serve vulnerable populations. She has nearly 10 years experience working for the state of Maryland, where she helped develop the 10-year plan to end homelessness and coordinated public health policy and legislation. At this time, she holds two positions, one as policy director to the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, and the other as policy, policy director for Healthcare for the Homeless of Maryland. In these dual roles, she is able to focus on national, state, and local health policy, particularly to ensure that implementation of the Affordable Health Care Act can accommodate the specific needs of homeless populations. So we'll get started, and I believe that Kevin is beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and hello to all of you watching online. Let's begin with this photograph, and I'll share a few observations that we've developed over the past 27 years and that are well documented by practice and public health research. Imagine living in a place like this, first of all. But um, place matters. Place matters. Homelessness is hazardous to your health, and housing is health care. Imagine taking care of 
basic daily human needs when you're living in a tent, and this, in fact, is where Tony was living, one of the clients at Healthcare for the Homeless. Uh, Tony passed away this past year, although he was not homeless when he died. He had moved into his own place. He had realized his dream of traveling across the country and moving to Las Vegas. Um, he dropped just an incredible amount of weight. He was stabilized on, on his, his diabetes, uh, was completely stabilized, his health improved, um, all because he was no longer living in this tent and he was living in his own place. Um, just an overview of what we're going to cover today, Barbara DiPietro and myself, um, we'll talk a bit about homelessness, particularly the relationship between homelessness and health and the model of care that not only Healthcare for the Homeless here in Maryland, but Healthcare for the Homeless projects all over the country have developed uh, to meet the unique needs and life circumstances of people experiencing homelessness. Then we will transition into a second part where we look specifically at the Affordable Care Act um, from a homelessness perspective. What is it that health reform uh, might mean for populations experiencing homelessness? First question, of course, is, well, how many people in the United States are experiencing it? And that's a, that's a really tough question to answer. Uh, it all depends how you count it, and it all depends what your definition is. Um, in the United States, it may not surprise you that we have at least three competing definitions of homelessness. Um, if one uses the HUD definition, housing and urban development, it's a relatively narrow definition, mostly including only people that are literally on the streets in, in shelter. Um, if you look at the definition, definition used by Health and Human Services that Healthcare for the Homeless operates, it also includes people who are doubled up, living transiently place to, uh, from place to place, if someone, which frankly is exactly how people experience homelessness. If you're having trouble making ends meet, you might depend upon your network, move in with, with family or friends. Um, the Department of Education also has a very broad uh, definition in order to identify children within the school system that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, what we have here are, are a series of data points. Um, and you can see who's doing the counting there uh, underneath and, and what they found. On a single night in January 2012, 6, 633,000, a little more, people experiencing homelessness nationally. This is how many people were physically counted by communities that went out and did a point in time survey. If you look at the annual prevalence uh, of those served in emergency and transitional housing programs that are funded through HUD, uh, 1.5 million in a year experiencing homelessness. If you look at children, it's been estimated that one in 50 children nationally experience homelessness. At health centers, a uh, little over a million patients uh, identified as experiencing homelessness served nationally by community health centers. And uh, more than a million students identified in K through 12 education. Uh, these are snapshots, and these are undercounts, troubled by the limitations of point-in-time point data and service data, a researcher named Bruce Link back in 1990 did a different kind of survey. Um, and he actually discovered that uh, the lifetime prevalence of homelessness in the United States is about 7% of Americans. 7% of Americans experienced homelessness in their lifetime. 14% um, of Americans, if you include that broader definition of doubling up uh, living with friends and neighbors. Um, if you look at a five-year period even, 3% uh, of Americans in a five-year period will experience homelessness. Uh, far higher than these numbers might suggest. And you might ask the next question, well, how did, how did Bruce Link uh, do this research in 1990? It was a telephonic survey randomly dialing telephone numbers, right. So uh, th there was a chuckle in the audience which suggests that that too might very well be an overcount when working with people that may not have ready access to phones. Suffice it to say that um, homelessness is um, prevalent in the United States and is only showing signs of increasing. Uh, this is again HUD data one night in January 2012 uh, looking at the number of people uh, experiencing homelessness on that night in Maryland and in Baltimore City. Uh, Baltimore City did a count last in 2011, and it was 4,088 different people. We're preparing to do our next count at the end of this month. 
those in the Baltimore area may hear of a, a week-long series of events that, that's going to take place uh, at the end of January and into early February. You can look here at the number of people identified as severely mentally ill, chronically homeless, uh, veterans, people who have HIV AIDS, uh, people who were homelessness due, uh, homeless due to domestic violence. Um, homelessness in Maryland shelters, this is the last data available from 2009. Um, look especially at the number of turnaways. So these are documented turnaways by Maryland shelters, more than 20,000. More than 20,000 is also, also significant when you look at shelter, uh, the, the length of stay in a shelter and the length of stay at uh, transitional housing. Look at the increase there, moving from 28 days to 48 days, 127 days to 162 days. So not only are more people experiencing homelessness, but they tend to stay in shelters for greater periods of time, uh, primarily because there's no access on the other end, access to affordable housing. And we'll talk more about that. Um, what are the causes of homelessness? Why do people experience it? And when we talk about causes of homelessness, there are certainly individual factors, and then there are structural factors. The individual factors are many and varied, and these are just a few of them. Abuse, family instability, domestic violence, foreclosure, unemployment, a range of health-related problems, medical and behavioral, incarceration, fire and disaster, uh, bankruptcy is a, uh, a leading cause of it. But then when we look at the fundamental structural factors, uh, homelessness is primarily rooted in poverty and extreme poverty and related especially to the lack of affordable housing. The United States spends um, approximately 40% of what it spent in 1979 on affordable housing. Let me say that again. The United States spends approximately 40% adjusting for inflation of what it spent in 1979 on affordable housing, a broad structural problem that has only fueled the increase in homelessness. Uh, lack of adequate access to health care, a leading cause. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this in a future slide, but uh, roughly 70% of people experiencing homelessness. That number's going down a little bit, but that's been the trend nationally. 70% are uninsured, not because they're eligible but not enrolled in programs like Medicaid, but primarily because they are not eligible for programs like Medicaid. Um, health reform and specifically Medicaid expansion is going to change that dramatically, and Dr. DiPietro will uh, talk to us more about that later. And then thirdly, lack of livable incomes. Uh, the minimum wage, uh, as is well known, pays less adjusting for inflation in many cases than it did 30 years ago. Um, at the federally mandated minimum wage of $7.25 an hour, um, a family working the minimum wage cannot afford a two-bedroom apartment anywhere in the country, anywhere in the country. So housing in the private market is, is out of reach for very low income and vulnerable people. Um, the amount that we spend on subsidized housing has, has uh, declined dramatically, and so many people are left with no options at all. Uh, Healthcare for the Homeless did a recent survey and found that 20% of respondents in this survey uh, were working and were living in homeless shelters because their incomes were too low. Almost 30 years ago now, there was a uh, physician working in New York City, uh, Dr. Philip Brickner. He was at uh, St. Vincent Hospital, and he discovered that there were people coming into the hospital emergency room that literally were carrying everything they owned with them carrying everything on their backs. He convinced his administration to let him establish a clinic, a primary health care clinic, to begin providing health care needs to these folks that appeared to have absolutely no place to go. Um, the head of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation at the time was visiting New York, alarmed by the number of people that were experiencing homelessness. Remember, this is back in the early 80s when homelessness was, was not as prevalent as it was today. There began a series of conversations, and a national research demonstration grant uh, came of it, the um, Healthcare for the Homeless program, uh, funded in 1985, 19 communities throughout the country. Baltimore City was one of them. At the end of that three-year period, these were the grand lessons. 
which now it, it, it makes one wonder why we needed so much research to, to document these, but, but nonetheless, the, these, this is uh, the result of that research demonstration project. Homelessness causes health problems. If you are experiencing homelessness, you're likely to get sick. It exacerbates existing illnesses. If you're already sick, you're likely to get sicker, and it seriously complicates treatment and continuity of care. Um, where do you keep your medications if you're insulin dependent and have to refrigerate them and you don't have a place to stay? Um, it's also, we know, an, a risk factor for early death. Um, and it's such that homelessness is really equivalent, the equivalent of an additional diagnosis in the healthcare setting. And in fact, it is an additional diagnosis. Uh, the ICD-9 code, uh, V60 right there, is for lack of stable housing. Uh, I'm told by Barbara DiPietro that it's entirely underutilized. So those of you that, that do research involved in coding, in, encourage people to make use of this code. Um, it's actually in the DC, in, in uh, the, the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual, or ICD-9 code, rather. Um, homelessness limits adherence. What do I mean by that? Adherence in uh, traditional medical care or behavioral health care. Medications could be lost or stolen. You don't have a watch. You don't have a calendar to write things down. You don't have that little bulletin board to uh, put your, put your uh, appointment there or an iPhone or iPad these days to put it in. No routine supplies, copays unavailable, meals unavailable, or really on someone else's schedule. Uh, most of the people served by Healthcare for the Homeless get their one meal of the day at Our Daily Bread, which is the city's largest soup kitchen, a uh, certain time of day, and uh, that might be their primary source of, of food. Um, so, some treatments risk arrest, uh, arrest in the community. So if someone's on a diuretic and doesn't have a regular place to go, quite literally. Uh, there are not an abundance of easily accessible public restrooms in Baltimore City or in many communities, and uh, many of the folks that we work with end up getting uh, arrested and incarcerated uh, because they were adhering to the medications that we prescribed. Um, generally, people experiencing homelessness uh, suffer the same range of health problems that the rest of us do, only at extremely higher rates. That said, um, here are some common diagnoses that health providers see when working with this population. Infectious disease, uh, hepatitis, HIV, TB, uh, far higher in homeless populations. Uh, chronic disease, diabetes, asthma, hypertension, heart disease are the big ones. Uh, parasitic skin infections. Our previous uh, medical director, uh, Danielle Robert Shaw, was a, uh, a fan of lice and scabies and did much to educate the staff at Healthcare for the Homeless and uh, uh, shelter providers in the community as well. Uh, dermatologic conditions, skin conditions, uh, weather-related problems. Trench foot is not just for uh, war veterans any longer. Uh, trench foot is seen in communities uh, all over the United States when, when people uh, live under bridges and on park benches. Um, chronic pain, poor dental health. Uh, Medicaid in Maryland and in most states does not cover adult dental care. Uh, so as you might imagine, um, uh, dental health can deteriorate relatively rapidly when you don't have a regular place to go for preventive care and don't have any access to restorative care. Let's talk a bit about infectious disease. Um, I mentioned that the rates were higher. A prevalence of HIV in homeless populations compared to general populations in the United States, 3.4% in the homeless population and still less than a percent in the United States. That's striking. Some areas of the community of the country, including Baltimore, um, it's far higher, um, primarily because Baltimore still remains the heroin capital of the Milky Way, and uh, IV drug use is is common. Um, hepatitis C. One homeless veteran study found a prevalence of 44 percent of Hep C. This is striking. Uh, in Baltimore, 26 percent of the people we served had HCV listed in their top three ICD-9 codes in 2009. Um, troubled by that, we decided to test further. Uh, we follow the CDC guidelines and do, and do um, universal testing, and closer to 45% of adults are positive for chronic HCV. 
That's striking. And um, the consequences of that, I think, we're still working through. Uh, behavioral health conditions. Rates really depend on the population being screened, and it, again, it depends upon whose definition you're lo or whose data you're looking at. Generally, according to HUD data, Housing and Urban Development, um, about 18% have a, a serious mental illness, 21% uh, a chronic substance abuse uh, issue, and 50% uh, of folks with mental illness also have a substance abuse disorder. Um, according to HUD data. The Healthcare for the Homeless experience and our data uh, suggest that it's even higher. About a third of those served by Healthcare for the Homeless in Maryland, and, and this is similar to Healthcare for the Homeless projects nationally, has a major Access One mental health diagnosis, schizophrenia, bipolar, uh, major clinical depression. 25% um, of the people that we saw last year were duly diagnosed with both addiction and mental health. And, and that's, a, that's a troubling um, uh, couple of conditions to, to treat. Um, of course, there's a lot of data um, that uh, this is along the lines of homelessness, homelessness being hazardous to your health about morbidity and mortality in homeless adults. The average age of death among people experiencing homelessness uh, between 42 and 52 years of age, right? Despite the average life expectancy, of uh, about 80 years in the United States. Um, homeless persons less than 50 years old have the health of 70 year olds but do not qualify for Medicare. I like that bullet, thank, thank you, Barbara. Um, the, the first study comes from Dr. Jim O'Connell uh, who is a healthcare for the homeless leader and a researcher up in Boston um, who's done much work on, on uh, mortality in homeless populations. The last bullet here, an average of eight to nine concurrent medical illnesses comes from Dr. William Brakey, um, a uh, retired psychiatrist at Hopkins who still serves on the board of directors of Healthcare for the Homeless. He was a founding uh, board member of ours 25 years ago um, and did a lot of the early work on homelessness and health and homelessness and mental illness. Um, there's a growth in the number of kids experiencing homelessness. So whereas in the early days of healthcare for the homeless, we were primarily seeing single adults and specifically single adult men, we're seeing these days more women. A third of the people we saw in our organization last year were women and seeing more and more children. In Maryland, the population of school children um, in, in schools, the population identified as homeless doubled recently. There's been a lot of news coverage about this, not just unique to Maryland, it's happening all over the country as well, particularly in this economy. Um, greater than twice as likely as children who are middle class to have moderate to severe or acute and chronic health problems. So again, um, homelessness leads to health problems and exacerbates existing illnesses, uh, has a negative impact upon school performance, obviously, and leads to increased rates of uh, fill in the blank. There's a partial list. As I mentioned previously, um, people experiencing homelessness generally are underinsured or uninsured. Um, this is Healthcare for the Homeless Maryland data of the little more than 9,000 different people we saw last year, and there's a big asterisk by the uninsured number there at 50%, at but let's go with that for a moment. 50% uninsured, about 20% Medicaid, about 5% Medicare. So about 25% Medicaid or Medicare. That additional 25% there, any ideas what that is? That is the primary adult care program um, which is a relative of our state's previous indigent care program, which today is folded into Medicaid. The state gets a federal match for it, but it's a Medicaid light program. It's primary care only. Uh, it's not true insurance. And in fact, um, this comes from um, HRSA's UDS, the Unified Data Set. Uh, we're being told this year uh, last year, we were told we had to count it as insurance in another category. This year, we're told that that is not insurance and we're to put it back into uninsured. So if you put those two together, 75% of our clients lack comprehensive health insurance. Um, that's what's going to change dramatically. Let's look at the national picture. 62% uninsured, 28% um, Medicaid, 5% Medicare. 
uh, and then some private insurance and some other. Uh, health reform and Medicaid expansion to 138% of all adults regardless of category um, will capture a large percentage of the people that we're serving. We, we believe that within a couple short years, 80 to 90% of the people we're, we're serving will be insured. And Barbara will talk much more about that. So homelessness is an ongoing problem. It's the result of very intentional public policy decisions in areas of, health, of housing, health care, and incomes, starting in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, and continuing today. Um, a dramatic disinvestment in housing, especially public and rental housing. Cost of living has increased faster than paychecks. Evictions are up. Unemployment is high, especially among low-income groups. Uh, Deinstitutionalization created a street homelessness among, with, uh, among those with serious and persistent chronic mental illnesses. Um, at the time, in the late 70s and early 80s, when the country was trying to wrestle with the growth in homelessness, why are people experiencing it, deinstitutionalization was cited again and again and again as the number one driver. Uh, what we're realizing now in retrospect is that it was a contributing factor. Um, we need a better way of addressing serious mental illness. No, we shouldn't institutionalize people, but we need to care for them in different ways in the community than we're caring for them now. Um, but it was less of a factor than some of the other factors that we now generally realize um, were, were causes of the problem, like the decline in investment of afford in, in affordable housing, for, for example. So the health care for the homeless model of care has grown since 1985. Uh, today there are well over 200, 213 some uh, projects nationally that receive federal health care for the homeless funding from the Bureau of Primary Health Care. Uh, the services include outpatient primary care, uh, mental health. Uh, these are our services here in, in, uh, in Maryland and in Baltimore. Uh, it's often said if you've seen one health care for the homeless program, you've seen one health care for the homeless program. They're, they're all designed to meet the unique needs of their communities, uh, but they provide uh, some essential services, the same range of services to people experiencing homelessness. Uh, we provide addiction treatment. We have a pediatric clinic, uh, a dental clinic, really Maryland's first comprehensive dental program for homeless children and adults. Um, we do a lot of outreach, case management, supportive housing programs. Um, our, the goal is to increase stability and improve health. Our goal isn't just to ensure access to health care, uh, but we're successful when we can stabilize somebody and house them. And then we find uh, that their health tends to improve, which takes us back to this notion that housing is, in fact, a, a form of health care. A little more on the current environment. Uh, there's an increasing understanding that, that poverty is really the core issue. Um, I mentioned the, the changing population in the interest of time. I won't go into 10-year plans, but most communities have developed 10-year plans to end homelessness. Most of them have to do with housing, health care, jobs, and a strong safety net, and most of them are woefully underfunded. There are some communities that have been making great strides. Um, Baltimore has been working a lot in the housing first model, and I'll, I'll conclude with an analysis of that. Um, but more resources are needed, and it's extremely difficult in this environment where there is a, um, a, a lack of political will and uh, an extreme stalemate uh, on investing, uh, social investments in, in the United States. Um, health reform will has the capacity, we believe, to uh, dramatically improve access to care and improve the health of vulnerable populations if we implement it in the right way. Uh, and if we use it as an opportunity to uh, sustain people in permanent housing and off the streets. Um, there's also a paradigm shift going on. Um, for much of the past 30 years, homelessness has been treated um, with a, a, let's call it a housing readiness model. So someone's experiencing homelessness, the, answer, the, the question was, well, what's, what's wrong with them? What do we need to fix? Let's get them access to health care and mental health services, and let's move them into a transitional shelter, uh, and then let's finally find a way to end their homelessness. 
Um, what we found in that paradigm is that the poorest and sickest tended to stay on the streets. Uh, and th those that could navigate various systems tended to move through them, but then people kind of got bottlenecked up in that continuum of care because there wasn't sufficient housing at the end. Um, the model that's really being shifted to now, and right now I think there's still two uh, competing paradigms, is one of housing first. Uh, and we generally find that if you um, help rehouse someone as quickly as possible without treatment as a precondition, right? Still might have uh, a range of medical problems, still might have a mental illness, still might have an addiction, and might not be getting treatment for it. But if we house someone first, they tend to stay. 85% of the people that we've housed using this model stay housed and off the streets long term, our oldest program being eight years. 85% still housed and off the streets. Uh, but their health also tends to improve. They show up less often in emergency rooms. They don't get arrested as often, if at all. Um, this is Christopher. Christopher lived for 15 years on a park bench in War Memorial Plaza in front of Baltimore City Hall. People tried to do outreach to him. Um, he, would, he would start screaming and chase people away. Um, he was deemed not housing ready for every program that people helped him apply for. Not housing ready, not housing ready. Well, he never got access to the services that he, that he needed. Um, Christopher was one of the first people that with this housing first approach in Baltimore, uh, we helped and we placed him directly into housing. Uh, and guess what? He stayed. He's, on his, he's, he's moved a couple of times. We've helped him, helped him move, but he's still in the program. Um, he's connected to Care at Healthcare for the Homeless. He's connected to mental health services, uh, connected to medical services. And in fact, this mural, which for those of you in the Baltimore area may, may recognize, it's on the side of the Healthcare for the Homeless building. It was created by the staff and clients of Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, when the reporter for the Baltimore Sun was covering the unveiling. Uh, Christopher, this gentleman, was standing right next to me because he had helped create that mural. And the reporter said, Christopher, what part did you work on? And he pointed to the moon and stars up on the top of this mural. And he said, I worked on those because when I was sleeping on the park bench and I looked up at night, those are the things that I saw. Um, Christopher today is no longer homeless uh, because we were able to house them and then give them the care that the care that he needed. It suggests a direction for future public policy that how we deal with homelessness is to essentially treat it as a housing problem, uh, rehouse people as rapidly as possible, and then bring the services to bear that someone might need for a short period of time or a long period of time that keeps them stably housed and off the streets. And with that, I will uh, introduce Dr. Barbara DiPietro, who will talk to us about uh, the importance of health reform for vulnerable people and the opportunities we all face to implement Medicaid expansion in the right way. Barbara. 